Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Dr. Matthew Leonardi. I'm coming to you from McMaster University in Hamilton, Canada, and I'm honored to be speaking to you today about the expectant management of patients with tubal ectopic pregnancy. I'd like to thank the organizers of this meeting for the kind invitation. Here are my disclosures. And if anybody has any questions after this session or wants to connect through social media for networking, please do reach out on any of these platforms. Today's talk is first gonna start with a, an example and some pretty pictures. Then we'll speak about some guidelines that have been published on the topic. We'll look at the evidence that is used to formulate those guidelines and finally conclude with a practical approach. We'll first start with a patient. We had a presentation of a lovely 30-year-old female who was referred to me as the on-call gynecologist with a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. The patient was reportedly, as per the emergency room physician, clinically stable. We immediately opened the pictures as we had not scanned this patient ourselves, though in many cases we do, and we looked at the fluid in the pouch of Douglas called the sac, and we questioned whether this was actually ruptured or not. Uh, very unusually, a patient with a ruptured ectopic pregnancy would not be presenting with clinical stability uh, and would have abnormal vital signs or abnormal blood work results, uh, and so this was questioned by us. We then found the ectopic pregnancy on the pictures, and this had a maximum diameter of 2.5 centimeters. Just around the ectopic pregnancy, there was a bit of heterogeneity, uh, a little bit of what we believe to be some clot representing some bleeding activity, which makes sense, uh, but no evidence of rupture, no evidence of significant free fluid on this side. Very importantly, this patient's HCG at this point of presentation was 608. Based on my learning from various units around the world, I generally do not make a decision of treatment on the day of diagnosis of a patient with an ectopic pregnancy. And if they are clinically stable, we'll bring them back in 48 hours for a repeat HCG to understand the trend of that HCG, which makes some uh, decision-making easier. Uh, for us, whether somebody should be a candidate for expectant management, medical management, or surgical management. In this case, the patient's HCG did drop uh, from day of diagnosis to 48 hours later, and we did go on to manage this patient entirely expectantly uh, with uh, complete resolution of the ectopic pregnancy and no additional treatments needed, and she was very happy with this approach. Let's talk a little bit about the guidelines. Uh, it would be nice if every institution, every organizing body representing OBGYNs around the world uh, would publish guidelines and make them open access. Uh, however, that's not the case. Uh, in uh, the world of ectopic pregnancy, there are three organizations that do publish guidelines uh, that are readily accessible, the NICE guidelines from the United Kingdom, the SOGC guidelines from Canada, and the ACOG guidelines from the United States. Let's start with ACOG because these are the ones that have the least amount of information around ectopic pregnancy expectant management of any of the guidelines. Last published in 2018, and really, this is their main concluding statement. There may be a role for expected management of ectopic pregnancy in special circumstances. They don't really even detail what that means, though they do reference a study that has a threshold HCG of 200, demonstrating uh, some efficacy in the management of those patients when it's lower than 200, though this was an observational study. The SOGC guidelines just published last year are um, certainly much more detailed than the ACOG guidelines and do utilize some of the higher quality RCT level literature. Uh, they do suggest that patients should be entirely asymptomatic and have an HCG of less than 1,000. Interestingly, they talk about this change in beta HCG, which is something that, like I said, I use, uh, but I use based on my learning in the United Kingdom and in Australia. However, in Canada, this is something I've not seen practically used. So it's interesting that they've included it and suggested that it should be part of the decision making. Uh, 
but I question whether it's actually being implemented. The NICE guidelines you can see here are much more detailed. They actually do perform a systematic review and meta-analysis, and they do include in this meta-analysis four studies uh, to come to their conclusion that in patients who are clinically stable, they do also suggest without pain, those with a small ectopic pregnancy and with an HCG of less than 1500 can be considered for expectant management. They do differentiate between the group of individuals with an HCG of less than 1000 and those with an HCG of 1000 to 1500, as there is a bit lower quality evidence for the group between 1000 and 1500. However, they do suggest that it is still a possible option that can be considered. In 2020, myself and a number of colleagues from Australia, Canada, and New Zealand performed a systematic review meta-analysis on this ourselves. And you might ask why we did this, considering that there was a NICE guideline that had just done this. We looked at that NICE guideline and identified that there were a number of studies that were, in our opinion, questionably included. The studies that we included were the Silva and colleagues study from 2015, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that study in a second, the Yurkovic and colleagues study from 2017. However, we decided to exclude the Van Mello study from 2013 and the associated studies from that same original patient population, which included an abstract presentation by Wecker and then a subsequent publication by Van Mello again. Uh, and we excluded these because the participants included those with pregnancy of unknown location, which we all know is not equivalent to an ectopic pregnancy. In those with APUL, they may have a viable intrauterine pregnancy or a non-viable intrauterine pregnancy uh, who would not be appropriately treated by methotrexate. Uh, and so in our opinion, this skewed the results of the NICE guideline meta-analysis and we wanted to uh, do this again in a more methodologically rigorous uh, fashion. The Van Mello study, though still a very good study uh, of good methodologic quality, uh, randomized patients to methotrexate versus nothing, no placebo control, no normal saline. Uh, and in the original study, they looked at key metrics such as resolution and avoidance of surgery. In their later study, it was focused on quality of life and the Wecker abstract focused on fertility outcomes. Nonetheless, we believed this was not appropriately included in the meta-analysis and we excluded it. The Silva study was a single center study compared to Yurkovic, which was multi-center. Silva required a decrease in the HCG at the 48 hour mark following diagnosis, whereas Yurkovic did not. Their starting HCGs were different. 2000 was the threshold in the Silva study and less than 1500 in the Yurkovic study. Both studies did, did require no fetal cardiac activity. Uh, however, Silva also included a size cutoff. When we performed the meta-analysis based on these two studies alone, uh, we found that there was insufficient evidence that methotrexate yielded a difference in the resolution of the ectopic pregnancy or the avoidance of surgery compared to expectant management. Now, this is actually not different than the outcome of the NICE guideline, which included the Van Mello study and one other study that I'll tell you about on the next slide. And so we performed a subgroup analysis uh, with the Van Mello study uh, included in our results, and we came to the same conclusion. So it doesn't actually change the result of the meta-analysis, but still, in our opinion, it was inappropriately included. The fourth study that was included in the NICE guideline was a study from 96 published by Corhonen and colleagues. And we elected to exclude this study because their intervention was oral methotrexate rather than intramuscular methotrexate. We now know intramuscular methotrexate is the more appropriate uh, administration technique. And so we felt that this was also inappropriately included in that NICE guideline since it is not uh, even a clinically relevant intervention anymore at this time. Let's talk about the approach to a patient pragmatically. When a patient is diagnosed with a tubal ectopic pregnancy, we must perform a clinical history, a physical examination, we must review the imaging, and we must review the blood work. 
we must consolidate that information and talk with our patients about their particular clinical scenario. Every individual is going to be different and every individual is going to have their own preferences around their decision making. In the absence of very clear evidence that methotrexate is superior to expectant management, it is appropriate to offer expectant management. And if a patient would like to select that, then we absolutely should support them in that decision. There are certain key features that should be present for us to have expectant management on the list of viable options, including clinical stability, including no cardiac activity. And at this point, based on the evidence, definitely an HCG of less than 1500 would be appropriate to consider. However, we should always be questioning what we do and why we do it and whether there is an alternative. And so one of the things that I think should be questioned, particularly as it's been described in the meta-analysis and guidelines, is this concept of asymptom asymptomatic nature. Most patients with ectopic pregnancy do have a degree of pain, do have a degree of bleeding, which would render them not asymptomatic, but rather symptomatic. Uh, and based on the guidelines, they should not have expectant management. However, this to me is an interesting uh, feature that maybe we should be questioning a little bit more carefully. The other is whether we should use the HCG trend from day of diagnosis to 48 hours. This is something that I do routinely and a number of other units around the world do routinely. It has been published by Kirk and colleagues uh, from the Tom Bourne group and an abstract has been published uh, by Keiko and colleagues from the Condus group uh, and in those two studies, the starting HCG was less than 5,000. And if there was a downtrending in the 48 hours following the day of diagnosis, then they were eligible for expectant management. So this is something that we should be considering. And therefore, we should be questioning whether this cutoff of 1,500 is relevant, whether we should be looking at the day of diagnosis HCG and the 48-hour HCG, uh, from a relative standpoint and an absolute value standpoint. If a patient is going to pursue expectant management for tubal ectopic pregnancy, then we should be following their HCGs closely on day two, four, seven, and weekly thereafter. We should be looking for a fall, a decrease of HCG by 15% or more with each blood test. If that does not happen, we should consider a change in the course of management either methotrexate or surgery, or if there is a degree of uncertainty still as to the potential utility of expectant management, then that may still continue to be an option. For example, if we have a very close to the cutoff decrease, but not quite 15%, should we you know, completely change course at that point or not? This is where talking with the patient and bringing in their autonomy and informed consent is essential. In conclusion, expected management should be offered as an option if they meet certain criteria, but we should be a little bit more detailed than what ACOG has suggested as special circumstances. The NICE guidelines are certainly the most comprehensive to follow, but there are some questionable studies included in that meta-analysis, in my opinion, and in the opinion of the group that I published the meta-analysis with. No matter what, informed consent is the most important element of a patient's care. They need to be in control of the decision because it is their body. Finally, the exact ideal circumstances for managing a patient with a tubal ectopic pregnancy expectantly are still to be determined. More studies are necessary. Before leaving you today, I just want to put a little plug in for a new society, the Gynecologic Ultrasound Society of North America, which is aiming to enhance education, research, and advocacy around gynecologic ultrasound for patients with gynecologic diseases. We all know that there is such potential for gyne ultrasound, and this really needs to be pursued, particularly in North America, where unfortunately, I think we are a little bit behind. Here's a QR code that you can consider scanning if you're interested in free membership. You don't even have to be from North America to join. Anybody from around the world is welcome. Finally, I'd like to thank all of you for your attention today. 
And I'd like to thank the organizers again for the invitation. I do look forward to the question and answers part of this day. Thank you. Bye-bye.